All right, here we go. The Bishop Don Magic Juan. Hey, man, it's such an honor and a pleasure, Jack, to be back on your show. Man, I want to tell you, this show growing by leaps and bounds, so I feel honored and be able to share my story. Absolutely, man. And we've known each other for, man, must have been close to 10 years. Or a little bit more. I yeah. mean, you know, like time be flying, man. And, yeah. you know, like we was meeting like what, first in Miami? Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, always out in L.A. and yep. somewhere in Hollywood, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. And, I used yeah. to stop by your show, you know. I interviewed you yeah. there and some of your guests and we would hang out and smoke afterwards. Oh, the fellowship's been great, man. Absolutely. And it's just an honor to be able to, you know, express myself. Uh. I mean, you look great. You look thinner than I remember last time. Healthy skin is looking, you know, well, good. You, well, you know, one thing I learned, though, you know, as an older age that we don't recognize in young age, that we must take care of ourselves at a younger stage to make the older stage a little bit more better. Yeah. But we don't recognize that until the last minute. So me as one, you know, I've never been into the health, never tell anybody to do what you want to do. That's my motto. But you know, at this stage, I realize that health is really well today. And I recommend all men 45 and over to get tested for prostate cancer. Mm. You know, I am a survivor of prostate cancer. So it, it do take place and you can be cured, but you gotta catch it at an early stage. And you know, a lot of men, they don't wanna go down there and get tested. They don't wanna know that they got it. But I was told by the doctor that if you continue to live, it's strong possibility like 99 and a half percent that you're gonna catch it. You know, so I think people should get tested earlier, you know, so go down there, player. Well, look, you are 68 years old right now, uh, turning 69. Well, let me, well, don't move me too fast. I'm 67. 67, my, my bad. My birthday coming, I will okay. be 68, and I thank God for it, but you know, I'm the guy that live one day at a time. So, you know, by you saying 68, you didn't put me seven months up. No, so no. let me enjoy this 67, Jack. I'm feeling younger, you did? Cause that ain't gonna put a little bit more on it. But I feel good, I feel blessed, I'm thankful. I ain't missed the beat. You know, as relevant today as I was in the 70s, uh, still got folks like Snoop Dogg, P. Diddy on my line, stopping by the Honeycomb, which is my apartment, the fellowship. I'm still giving good game to people on the internet, and I'm always open for famous players and different movie stars, you know what I mean, to give good advice, you know what I mean? Like they know I've been there, done that, so you know what I mean, they know. Hey, I live that life so I can give you some real serious game. And you know, like I said, hey, you can't lose with the stuff I use. <laughs> well, listen, I think that we would all be extremely lucky to be 67 years old and look as great, you know, as you're looking right now and doing as well as you're doing. You know, still still doing what you want to do every morning. Uh, uh. You know what I mean? You I know, love it. I love hey, it. Hey, but I'm, I'm, believe me, you know, I'm feeling blessed and I'm thankful for it because, you know, like I say, you know, any moment things can happen. You know what I mean? Uh, not long ago, you know, I was in the hospital for blood clogs, uh, you know, that kind of thing, feeling like it was over. You know what I mean? You can get that feeling when you're sick and different things. So I feel honored to be here, to be able to be on your show to express these things, to let people know that things do happen in this life, but you don't give up. You mm. keep on, you know what I mean? You keep on progressing. You keep on trying to follow your dream. And you know, like today, it's been so much distraction, confusion, and misunderstanding, and hate, and jealousy, that people are missing their dream. They're missing the mark because most people, especially with social media going on, is trying to imitate lives that they're not even accustomed to. Mm. And it's causing them a problem, not the person they're trying to imitate, mm. because the person they're trying imitate don't even know it so yeah. it's causing people problems you know what I mean and I say you know work with what you dealt with use your hand make it better for yourself like a lot of people say uh, I'm looking over there at somebody else's grass the reason it's greener because they water it you didn't forgot about your grass water your grass you can make happen what you see with your eyes if you have confidence in yourself 
Well said, man. Let's go ahead and talk about your story. Because we, you know, we did an interview last time, but it wasn't like a, you know, a full sit down like we're doing right now. Well, it was amazing, though, because, you know what I mean? Boy, we, it was so colorful. I even watch it today. <laughs> the girls that I had on, they had such loud colors on, and I had my color with after a radio show. I mean, it's such beautiful lighting, and I mean, the interview, it was just an amazing. I mean, you don't even have to listen to nothing I said. Just look at it. I mean, it's so beautiful. Girls, they don't look like pink and purple and things. Like, it was just a beautiful setting, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you were born in Chicago. Born and raised. Okay. West Side. And you had seven siblings. Sibling. Brothers and sisters. I am the eighth child. The eighth but, child. But you know, today uh, there was a number uh, that was calculated something like you know early in my life. You know, uh, right now we down to uh, off of the Patriot Tree. You know what I mean? To three. You know, uh, I come from a family of eight. I am the eighth child, which is the baby. But, you know, as of lately, I just lost two brothers within a year. Mm. So, you know, things are happening. You know what I mean? We're getting older and yeah. time is passing. So, you know what I mean? But I'm still confident that, you know what I mean, we can continue to go on. My, my condolences Thank for your you. loss. So here you are growing up in Chicago and you have eight kids uh and your parents are married no they wasn't okay. now see this this is the thing that uh, you know they don't understand and i think this is why such influence was on my life when i talk about my mother and father i usually say my mother showed me and taught me about love and my father taught me about money okay here's the thing and I asked my mother about it when I was able to ask her about it. When I came up, my father took me away from my mother. I stayed with my father something like eight and a half years before he passed. I used to come visit my mother then on the weekend sometime. Mm. And uh, my father, he had a restaurant. He had an ice cream parlor. He had three buildings. So every weekend I would come to see my other sister and brother. I would bring them candy and tater chips and, you know, give them a few dollars because this is what I had from my father. But my mother and father, they wasn't together. And I asked my mother after I got older, I'd say, how could my father take me away from you? She said back in them days, which was the 50s, she said, your father, as a black man, he had money. I said, wow, I mean, I said, wasn't it police and things like that? She said, yeah, but when you have some money in them days, you was able to bypass a lot of different things. Because I was wondering by me seeing it today, if you take somebody, there's a lot of court things and understand it. And I was just wondering why it didn't happen for me. But that's what she explained it to me. And by living with my father at an early age, I was exposed to so much because he had this restaurant, which was a soul food restaurant. Mm -hmm. And it was on the main street, which was Madison. And it was uh, across the street from the old Chicago stadium. So I was like in the restaurant from a baby. So I'm seeing everything. I even seen a man get killed in front of a pool room. I mean, I was on the main strip growing up. Mm. You know, my father was raising me in the restaurant. Sometime I stayed with my sister, which was on my father's side. And so, you know, and to my mother, and my father got some understanding. I was able to visit her, and then I was seeing both parents, and I was uh, seeing my sisters and brothers, you know. So it, it was an amazing journey. So I feel that's why I pick up the love from my mother and pick up the money part from my father because that's what he was into. And I could say my father wasn't really able to read and write. At five years old, I was selling candy and, you know, doing things for him. But he had buildings, he had ice cream parlors, he had restaurants. So it was amazing. He just had smarts. How old yeah. were you when you saw someone get killed? When I seen somebody got killed in front of the pool room, I think I had to be at least 
11 or 12 years old. Okay. It was after the time my father had died and my sister, she was still operating a restaurant mm. and I came down to get something from her and this pool room, this guy that came outside arguing and pow, shot him. And that wasn't, you know, and like I said, coming up in the inner city, that wasn't the last time that I seen somebody get shot or killed, rather. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, you know, like in that inner city, uh, it's sort of like a common thing. And it's so common today, like people are just like uh, dealing with it. Well, somebody got killed, yeah, you know, like in the norm when it really should be dealt with you know, properly, you know, yeah. but it, it, it's something that always been, and I was exposed to that early, mm -hmm. and you know, I continue to see it as I continue to grow up, uh, uh, being even so close to standing to a victim that was murdered several times in my life, this has happened. You know, me, myself, have become a victim of shooting. I was shot close range with a 30 gauge shotgun. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say things like that happen in the hood, you know, and you know, you grew up there, you sort of learn to deal with it. So you're growing up in the inner city of Chicago. And early on, girls seemed to like you. How old were you when you realized that girls were attracted to you? I, it was an early age. I, I must say, at 10 years old, I had two girlfriends. No, I'm, I'm going to tell you how it happened. First, I must tell you this. Um, at an early age, I was child molested. Uh, the babysitter, I remember, put me on top of her and, you know, whatever the situation was. But I remember her telling me, not to tell nobody. Right. And I never shared it because I really didn't know what it really was, you know what I mean? Right. And you were five years old. I was five years old. You at, lost your virginity at five years old. At five years old. Okay. And you know, like I didn't understand what the situation was, but like I said, as I continued to grow older, I could believe it was part of the effect at me because uh, at 13 years old, I was like staying with my sister-in-law, but sleeping with a lady that was 26 years old. Okay. And no, it was an embarrassing situation. And the way that it happened is, the lady used to come in like each night, like playing like she was drunk. And I'm thinking she was, you know, really drunk. So I'm thinking I'm really creeping, really taking advantage of her. So, you know, all of this growing up, this was part of the thing that was affecting me that might have led to where we going to as becoming a pimp and different things, you know what I mean? Yeah. But what, it, what really was, one day this lady told me, she gave her son some money to go out to get a hot dog and told me, and I'm 13, she said, now every time we did something, the lights was off, so I don't see you, you don't see me. I'm thinking you're drunk anyway, and you know, you calling me different names. So I'm, you know what I mean, I'm <laughs> thinking I'm slick. So here one day she told me right out, she wanted me to make love to her. Now I'm shamed, I'm shamed faced it. I mean, this done melted me like a piece of cheese. I mean, wow, you know what I mean? I, I never thought we'd be talking about it or nothing. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm really trying to play the dumb rap. And she said, no, nah, we ain't gonna never be friends or have if you don't do this right now. And you know, I'm nervous because you know, lights on, we know what's happening now and everything. I thought she didn't know this was taking place. But now she didn't expose, so we went on and I made it happen. And you know, like I said, things like that exposed to me at an early age that possibly trigger a lot of things that I've done in the future. Right, because, you know, people are going to look at the situation with you very differently than if you were a 13-year-old girl having sex with a 26-year-old man. That would be, be considered... Well, I mean, it's child no, molestation either way. I but for some reason, it's taboo, yeah. period. 
Yeah, it's but taboo. when it's a boy, for some reason it gets a pass a lot of the times. But it, you know, it is very traumatic either way. Well, yes, it is. But you don't think of it at the time. Yeah. And you know, like I said, it depends on the individual. Like I said, a girl or the guy. But believe me, it have a tremendous effect. And I know this by becoming a pimp and based on some of the girls that I had the chance to talk to that live with me, that spend time with me, that I seen deep inside of them that most of them had been molested mm -hmm. by an uncle or a cousin or nephew or something that trigger this that made them to want to be prostitutes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can always look back and you think, watch somebody do what they do. But you have to look back and see how they were brought up or what they were involved in that trigger the event that take place today. Even when, you know, young boys have sex early and they have a lot of girls and they like it, most just go and just try to juggle as many girls as they can. They try to have sex with as many women as they could possibly can, but you went a different route. At one point, women became a financial source. So at what point did it go from just having sex with girls, like you were just saying, to, okay, this has to be a financial transaction? Okay, it's one of these things. First, what I was exposed to, and my sister told me, we used to go to school together, and she told me, she said, look, Oh, these girls just be liking you and talking about you. Now, this is my sister telling me this about other girls. So, look, I had two girls. I'm in the hallway. I'm 10 years old. I'm kissing them both to try to analyze who kissed the best. Okay. My sister, my older sister, which is past name, Ann, came out the door and seen us and told them girls to get out of there and smack me upside the head and told me to get in the house. <laughs> but it was this effect that let me know that I could do this. Okay. And so what trigger the acting for money and the pimping was poverty. Okay, explain. Wanting to have money. Like you said earlier, coming up in the family eight, father died mother on welfare, you know, how you gonna make it? I mean, we have choices there. Very few of us become movie stars and singers. Then you have to juggle the other percentage of it, whether you wanna become a dope dealer, a murderer, a car thief, or a pimp. I chose the pimp life because I didn't like the violence of the game. That wasn't me. Like I tell a lot of people that got involved in drugs that was friends of mine, that ain't you. If you ain't going to kill, don't get into that. If you ain't going to be the first one to shoot, don't get into that because there's no softness in that life. So I decided, hey, the pimp on girls, you know why? Because if it had to be somebody to go to jail, I was going to let them go. Okay, well, I mean, you mentioned a bunch of different professions, but all of those are illegal. I mean, there's also all the legal professions out there that's open to, to lower income people. Well, I'm trying to express to you and those that are watching that it's not that many percentage down in the ghetto. It's not that many opportunities. Okay. I'm not saying it's, uh, how many you see doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs of blacks running around. Well, Come on, I'm giving you the percentage of what we have to go for yeah. what our opportunities are. Yeah, you said, yeah, you can go to school. Then the schools are being shut down. All the different programs that used to teach us trades, they didn't shut down. Most of the time in summer, you used to have summer program where they would pay people, young people, to go to that program to learn that job skill and pay them at the same time. All them programs are shut down. So people are really have to fend for themselves. Parents are not able to provide for their kids, especially with the economy today and the cost of living. You know what a pair of Jordan calls <laughs> and your kid don't want nothing else? He feel like this is his whole education to walk into the school with a pair of Jordan or I'm dropping out? Who? 
Well, I remember in Pimps Up, Hose Down, you said that you tried doing a regular job, but it just wasn't you. Well, I was in the Army. In the Army? Yeah. When I got out the Army, my big brothers, they wanted to try to make it happen, you know what I mean? Even before I went in the Army, I'm laid them a play. I got 13 girlfriends, the whole thing. I'm the king of the dance floor. All of this going on. Before I got drafted, I was drafted. I didn't volunteer. Ah, in there you were drafted for Vietnam? Yeah, that was the Vietnam era. Okay. So um, when I got out the Army, my brother tried to hook me up, you know, but I wasn't that kind of type. They got me a job at some steel mill. All I had to do was put some kind of iron up on <laughs> something every 30 minutes and let it go through. I'm smoking weed, man. I'm asleep somewhere. <laughs> I got girls coming under the fence, turning dates with the guys that work. I'm on the graveyard shift, man. Okay. I got girls coming under the fence, turning dates. I'm asleep. Hey, they get behind. Hey, we need certain certain. Fine. Then they give me a job at Swin where you make bicycles and different parts. I'm the guy that supposed to bring this part called a spark or something that the chains go on. <laughs> Man, I'm up in a bin sleep because I smoke weed. Knocked out way yet. Everybody behind. Couldn't make it happen. I never had a chance to work on a job for a year. I wanted to, you know why? Because it looked good getting that check and that extra check. Yeah. I never was able to get that. You know, in the day, them checks looked good. My brothers and sister, they was working, work a year. You get that check, you know, two weeks off. That was big to me, man, to have that money, you know? But it never worked for me. And I was so young where I used to get my brother's ID and go work a job and I work the two weeks. The week you get that check and hold back, we can then go back to school. Okay. I mean, that's how survival was in the days, man. Okay, so uh, how old were you when you got drafted uh, into the Army? 18. Aha. Uh -huh. I so cried, So were, were you pimping before 18? No, I was just at the board. I was just a, at the board. <laughs> I was a super player. Super player. I was a super player, man. I had 13 girlfriends, you know what I mean? I was the guy that danced with at the club, you know what I mean? I had girls taking me to breakfast after the club and things like that. And I had met the chick that was going to really turn my life around soon as I got drafted. We had just met, and all of a sudden I'm drafted, I'm gone. Mm. And you're gone for how many years? No, uh-uh, now hold up now, I'm a player now. I go into the army, I still got this instinct. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? I didn't told my mother, I can't do this. I want to get out of this. I did the first two months of basic training, like eight weeks of basic training. I passed basic training, then we went on leave. I stayed gone. <laughs> Never came back. I'm AWOL now. <laughs> the captain called. I'm married now. Call my wife and tell, would you tell your husband to come back to the army? I went on back and everything. They didn't do nothing to me and all of that. Get right back and form and everything. But see, I'm a player. This in me. When we all at the bowling alley, I got weed. I didn't got from a guy with me and the sergeant smoking. It was just that kind of thing. That's how my life always been. Guys on the army post was getting letters from their girl, dear John. They asked me to write the letter. I put some slick in there. Mm. Not a chick coming visit and writing them letters. <laughs> I mean, that's how it always was for me though, okay. you know what I mean? So I was discharged and like I said, my brother then was trying to get me jobs. It, it just wasn't happening for me, it, 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 you know what I mean? Like I said, uh, I always thought it was something big and better for me, especially after knowing that my daddy had all of these things. I knew I had to have something coming, but I didn't know what the destiny was. So you get, get out of the army, you try working these jobs, and it doesn't work out. At what That's point, all. Does the first female start giving you money? Okay. I told you when I was at the job. Okay. I had girls coming under the fence, turning dates with the guys at the job. I was working the graveyard shift. And I mean, you know, I'm 18 years old, you know, 19 years old. They coming under the fence, turning dates with the guys that work at the job, go back under the fence. And then, and when we get off at like what, uh, seven in the morning or something like that, if a guy won't defer it, I take him to my apartment and let him turn the date with the girl. Hmm. 
you know, then. So it was like in me, you know, like I had girls come by my house asking my mother, can they take me shopping? Now, I'm an aide. They asking my mother, could they take me shopping with they check and things like that. My mother had to agree with, you know, we want to do this for them and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Okay, so you're working this job and you got a couple, how many girls are coming through and turning I got dates? a couple of girls Two coming girls. on the defense. Two girls are coming in, having sex with the guys, and then bringing all the money back to you? Yeah. Okay. How do you compensate them at that point? I just bless them. I make sure they have what they need. Okay. You know what I mean? And I break them off. You know what I mean? I'm, you know, people know I'm a giving and, you know, generous guy. Especially if you step up to the plate, I got to bless you. You know what I mean? So I'm going to make sure you get what you want. If you want your hair, you want your nails, or you want a new outfit or some new shoes. And plus put some in your pocket. And if you got a kid, make sure you bless her. You can make sure the kid get an outfit for going to school or whatever it is. So, you know what I mean? It was always fair exchange. Wasn't no robbery. You know, only time I was always putting tax on a chick is if a chick stayed with me. You know what I mean? If we breaking bread together, it's a different thing. Because as entering the game, before I even started pimping on girls, I had girls that I used to take boosting. Some of them was my girls and some of them wasn't. What I mean boosting is you take them to different shopping malls and let them go in there and steal what they steal and you get a third of whatever they steal to be able to sell or off the money or whatever it is or whatever they sell to the fan. You get a percentage of that. That was my gang early time, taking chicks to malls, letting them go in there and steal and then, you know what I mean, dropping them back off. Okay, so you got a, a couple girls that are they're turning tricks for you. Mm -hmm. But you're not actually living with them at that point, are you? No. Okay. Uh -uh. So they're not technically your stable, or are they? They are they not technically my woman. Yeah. Because I don't have complete control over them. Right. You know what I mean? We making proposition. You know what I mean? Come on, baby, let's make this happen. I got these guys, blam, blam, blam. You know what I mean? If they gave me 250 or 300, you know what I mean? I might break her off for 50. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, you know what I mean? It was just compromised and working. Okay. So explain to me how the pimping started to get more serious and become an actual business as opposed to a side hustle, which is what this sounds like. Well, what happened is after I got out of the army, I run into this lady that I had been pursuing before I left. She was the like the queen of the town you know, the most downest lady, she was married, but she was, you know, driving a big old brand new, I think it was a, in the time it was a 72 Cadillac, you know, customized, big old gangster white walls and, you know, so when she seen me, she said, wow, what had happened to you? You know, I thought I had been to the army and blah, blah, we and things, but we reconnected and we, you know, and she was a little bit like maybe five years old of my senior and already in the game, getting money and I mean, I known, you know, international already. So we reconnected and she chose me to be a man. It wasn't just that easy because like I said, she had a husband and he didn't want it to happen and we had our little ups and downs together like it ain't for you no more, it's this what's going to happen, man, and you know what I mean? And Man, we started hitting the road, started getting money. She was not a prostitute, she was a thief. So we started hitting the road, we just getting money all across the country. You know, we just going everywhere, everywhere, just getting money and everything. So she was one on one of them uh, occasions um, that really solidified my game. And I felt good about it and she felt good about it. We was on the road out of town, and she had got busted in one of these towns. And I ain't gonna just name the town, cause they might be still looking for her, <laughs> you know what I mean? But they had busted her for some thievery work, you know what I mean? And uh, she escaped, she jumped out the window, but she came home to the hotel room with handcuffs on. Now I'm a young buck, my first time on the road, I'm really nervous like this, you know what I mean? But Amazing as it is, you know, as you watch TV, you really see how they really put um, bobby pins in the handcuffs and popped it. I mean, really, I took a big bobby pin 
and stuck it inside the handcuff and pop. <laughs> Man, if I didn't think it was magic or she thought it was magic, but it sort of solidified my game with her and with me too. It let me know, wow, we left that state and went to another state. But, but that's what took place. And so um, after me and her have been together for years, caught a big case in uh, Miami and um, she got 10 years. And um, I had a conspiracy on that case and it was throughout. So now she gone to do 10 years. I'm the number one pimp in the game. All the players saying, oh, he ain't no pimp, he had a thief. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Now they saying, oh, he ain't this, he ain't that. Now it's time to prove myself. Okay. So now the first thing that happened is a chick came to me. She was another pimp, bottom girl. And what I mean bottom girl, she's the one that make things happen. She said, look, I've been in the game for a year. I got in the gang to learn it so I could come be with you. Hmm. She came, she became my woman. Now all the time, now we still got controversy with the guy that she was with. We on the set for the fight and he trying to uh, snatch her off the stroll. He didn't pull another pimp and gave him a gun. He didn't pull the gun on me. All of these things happened, but the chick mine. Boom, here come another player, top chick. Come to me. Now I'm getting top chick players number one girl now. This is how the game going. It's solidifying my pimp game. I had been the number one pimp in the country for 13 years. It's from 1972 to 85. Now he had come all of these girls, I mean the guy top girl, and they stayed with me something like, man, 10 and 15 years. Hmm. Okay. This was the real deal, man. I was these girls everything. And the only reason that time expired is because God came into my life in 85 and changed my life. And I had to give it all up. The girls didn't want it. They asked me why that. I said, I didn't know, but God don't want me to do this no more. I mean, I was still active at it. The girls still wanted to do that. I mean, I can do that today if that's what I choose to do, but the desire is not there. And guy wanted to say, man, how is the desire not there? You don't want to pimp if the girl want to pimp. I'm amazed because I used to say when I was younger, pimp or die. And I thought I was going to pimp till I die. I never thought that I would reject it and didn't want to do it no more. Plus, I know I'm a little older and I ain't got time to be running to no police station and doing all that. Anyway, my sister used to be a big help at that. So you get your first girl and she's experienced. You know, if she's a bottom girl for another pimp, she's experienced. She knows... How, everything. How to, she knows everything. She knows the strolls. She knows the tricks. She knows the, the money, everything. So she starts, she hits the strip and starts bringing you money every day. Every day. Every day. Seven, seven days. 65 days a year. No days off. 52, what is it? 52 weeks a year. Yeah, weeks a year <laughs> and 12 what? 12 months. 12 months a year. <laughs> and then on leap year, 366 days. <laughs> Hey, they don't miss a lick, but this was the thing is, as a pimp, you know what I mean, I gave them Sundays off. You know, usually the chick works Saturday night, get off about 6, 7, 8, 10 in the morning, or sometimes you had to pick them up at the courthouse about 11 or 12 in the morning and stuff. But I usually gave the girls Sundays off. I mean, this was me. And I had top flight chicks, you know, we were seriously getting money. I was getting some money to where they thought I was like selling dope because in the 70s and 80s, dope dealers was a big thing. They was really getting money. But I was getting it from them females, you know what I mean? I used to have females working, you know what I mean, 17, 18 hours a day in 50 below zero weather and uh, a knee-high snow with a mini skirt on with pantyhose with a split in the middle, turning dates at it around the corner. Used to jump in a car with five, six guys, whether they be uh, uh, musicians or what, by the time they get around the block, you be done turn date with all of them and out with the cash. Okay. I used to sit on the stroll sometime. I had a custom made van and I used to sit on the stroll and I had a, a rock waller in there. 
And I used to have the one that cracked so much. And I used to tell the chick, just throw the money in there. And nobody would mess with the van. I'd be in the back. I had stole. It was custom. And I'd be asleep. But that Rockwaller would sit right in the window. <laughs> nobody would mess around. Chick just throw the money to fall down in the van. Six in the morning, they jump in. We drive on home. I how have, slick the game was, man. No, I actually have a Rottweiler myself, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> a Rottweiler yeah. will sit there. Yeah. And and, and not, yeah. no one will mess with hey, it. Man. It'll tear your head off if you try to come hey, in. Hey, you touch that one, it's like you're going to eat the glass. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I can relate. Yeah. Okay. How big did the stable get at the height? How many girls? The best I could do was seven. Seven girls at once. Yeah. But I was... Um, Constantly with three, constantly. I mean, my whole game for all the period of time in the game was like three constantly. I did up to seven, you know what I mean? I stayed in the house with seven girls. I mean, it was an amazing trip. And then it's, it's mind game. You know, you got to understand you're controlling all of these minds. And, you know, people have different thoughts and uh, different movements, but you have to control that. You have to, what I always tell a player, you got to put your mind inside of their mind so they'll be thinking like you. They can't think like they want to. It's not going to be effective. They got to think like you want them to. In order for them to do that, you got to incorporate your thoughts into their mind and let them feel what you feel, want the best, want to do this, wants to be there. I used to tell my girl, baby, I'm going to take you all to Hollywood. I did that. Mm -hmm. And see, a woman got to love a man that do what he say he going to do. They don't believe it from the beginning, no way, because they don't think that they uh, qualified to be in Hollywood. They didn't think that they should be. No way could they be there. And when they found themselves on Hollywood Boulevard, they was made the same thing when I took them to the White House and we stood at the gates of the White House. See, this is amazing from a girl that's coming from the street for a man to do what he say he going to do. And it's like putting him up on a pedal, letting him know I'm not ashamed of you. I will take you where I go. I remember you said when it comes to girls, one is so close to none. Well, the reason I say one is so close to none because if you have one chick and she gets sick or even if she die, well, if you ain't a pimp, you become holits. And if you just uh, boyfriend and girlfriend, you'd lose that chick. So I always thought if you have two or anything and one gone, you still have one left. Right. So definitely as a pimp, it's not good to have one girl. You got to have more than one. And also it increase your money. So you have these, these group of girls, okay, up to seven at one point. Yeah. And from the outside, it looks glamorous. But... You know, for example, I just interviewed Sugar Free, who, who was a pimp for a long time. And he, and he kind of broke down the difficulty of trying to manage so many personalities. You got to, you got to understand something. You know, here it is. You got multiple women. Okay, these bitches got different birthdays. They both, uh, favorite food is different. They like different shit on the radio. Um, some of them got kids and shit. Some of them got kids that live far, far out. Some of them got kids just across state. It might be their birthday or the mother's birthday. And here you are. That, that You know, that's why they say, you know, a real pimp don't get no sleep because, um, you know, them bitches constantly need shit. You know what I mean? And you got to be willing to, okay, bitch, come on. So the, the stress involved in keeping track of all that is extreme. Would you tend to agree? Well, I, I think it's extreme to one that is um, not capable. You know, like I said, a lot of people take on a challenge that's really not their challenge. You know what I mean? Uh, it's got to be in you and not on you. A lot of guys got it on them, but it ain't in them. And they'll take the rich and try for the paper, for the glamour, for the glory. But it don't mean it's really their job. Like I know some real serious professional pimp that have played it for years, but they going, they working job, they doing this, they doing that. I don't think, I mean, I said to myself, God, please don't curse me like that. You know what I mean? Because 
I don't think as a pimper player, that gang is always in you. But see, some of them guys get to where they can't play it no more because it really ain't in them. I understand what Sugar Free was saying, but it's all about the control. You make that stuff where it's convenient for all parties. Definitely you got girls that got babies. Some of the girls that you have, they have, might have two, three chicks. I mean, two, three babies. I mean, mama don't want it. I've been through all that where mama then reached and hit me with a baseball bat. Get out of here. No, I want my prostitute. I'm not leaving. That prostitute knowing her man, her mind that she got to come. You know, so like I said, guys take on the challenge. Like Too Short told me before, he had a guy with him, they used to call him some kind of pretty boy or something, and he used to play the pimp pie. Too Short told me the man actually went mentally on that because girls was really coming to him to try to get him to pimp them. And that really wasn't his makeup, but it was just something he was doing as part of the Too Short act. <laughs> so I'm saying things happen to guys like that, but if it's in you, you can deal with it. I'm not mental. I was able to deal with it. I had women that had had babies. I mean, from different parts, from different nationalities, from different races. I mean, you deal with that. See, a lot of guys have done with um, these different videos, like Too Real for TV and things like that, where they didn't heard different pimps say a lot of things. Everything that they said out their mouth wasn't necessarily true, but a lot of guys that listen, they learn everything they say and they try to run it to a female. And it works all the way till they get to the part where it ain't no more to say and they don't know what to say, so now it's over. Mm -hmm. So what they really was doing was meddling in something that they shouldn't have been involved in because they make it bad for the guy that really seriously pimping. Mm. Somebody that is their lifehood. It's like some of the dope dealers. They had girls, but it wasn't their livelihood. They was meddling. They was using the drug to captivate the female so that she would go on the street to sell her body for them so they could impress a real pimp saying, I got a prostitute, but they wouldn't uh, what I say, uh, making her do what they wanted her to do. She can go out and maybe come back with $50. A real pimp ain't living like that. He's not going for that. But it wasn't their livelihood. When it's your livelihood, you have to really stick to that because you seriously paying bills, uh, car notes and all kind of things, jewelry. You sending kids through school off of that pimp money. I have done that. When you have a number of females, problems start to arise. You know, and last time we, we even talked about how violence becomes part of the pimp gang. How sometimes you've said that you've had to put your hands on women. Fighting is like a criteria. You know, it's like the jewelry, the clothes, and all that, the cars is a criteria. It do happen, it's part of the game. You know what I mean? Because you got to establish a certain thing. You got to establish some fear in that female in order to get that respect. You must establish that. And she's gonna try you to see if you qualified to get that respect from her. So it's gonna bring some fear. And, when, and, and what I'm saying is, violent, you know what I mean? And, 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 and it's something that don't have to take place, but it do take place because you're establishing something here that I am the one that you listen to and believe in and nobody else. And you know, like I said, when I had to fight the girl, it wasn't for money. You know what I mean? Maybe you left the stroll and I told you not to. You know what I mean? You know, when you violate certain things, you have to check them. If you do it, you know what I mean, verbally, okay. But in the pimp game, it don't necessarily work like that. You have to really put your feet down. You know what I mean? You have to really show that girl. You have to almost, if you told that girl you was going to kill her, when it comes time to fight, you have to almost tell her to beg you to say, Daddy, no, please don't kill me. It has to be that serious. Well, the thing about it is, you know, 
Only one understand a prostitute or hoe is a pimp, and she understand the pimp. Because, see, now, a lot of people on the outside, and I say squares and lanes because they really don't understand the game. And they see a guy put his hands on a girl, and they say, oh, he weak, he did, he shouldn't be hitting a woman and different things like that. But now, it's a criteria and certain things that take place in the game. If you a fighter in the ring, you got to hit because that's what it called for. You can't be no pimp, and you definitely can't control a prostitute without fear. You got to put that fear in her in order to get that seriously respect from her. And then you got to understand this, and I'm a witness to this, and I testify to this, that it is some girls in the game that don't believe you care about them or love them unless you put hands on them. Daddy, I didn't did all this and you ain't hit me. She would do everything she can to get you to hit her. And if you don't, she gonna feel left out that you don't care, that you let her do these things and didn't hit her. She feel in her heart with all her might that if you hit her, you care about her. That is part of the game. And it might sound unusual and it might sound strange to some squares, but it's the truth. Well, it's like you said, these girls are coming from, you know, extremely bad backgrounds. Hold it. You can't say that. You can't say that? No. Well, you said that all of them have usually been sexually abused and well, so forth. I did, but I didn't say they all come from background because you get them from the suburbs also. Okay. You know what I mean? It's just different things that they go through. Now, you can say in the suburbs that they was always like kept under a glove. And once they get free, they get a chance to do and see everything. So it ain't about just a person in the ghetto being child molested. I mean, you got some rich and famous that wanna experience that life, that endure that life. It, it, it's not a respect the person because when you speak prostitution, you got black, white, red, green, blue, all nationality. Mm -hmm. And some be most clean girl that come out of some of the best houses that you could ever, you know, ever see. And some do it even to, um, to help their college tuition. Hmm. Oh, you'll be surprised at a girl that sell their bodies. Oh no, don't take it to the lowest and the scum of the world cause there's some that on top of the world that do it. Some of your most respected girls are the most elite that are prostitutes. Well, well I remember there was a story you, you said about how one of your girls got shot uh, on the strip and she was in the hospital badly, badly hurt, almost dying. And her mother was there. And when she, and when you came in, she said, daddy, help, help, help me get up out of this bed so I can go, go back to the track and, and make that money for you. Well, let me tell you about that story, which is a true story, man. And you know, when I speak on this story, I speak on dedication. This is dedication. Dedication to the man, dedication to the game, and dedication to they self. You know, you got some people that get into the game and wants to play by the rules. They want to do everything that the rules of the game requires of them to make them part of and successful in the game. And this female was one of them people. She was working one day. You know, like, you know, sometimes female go out and work in the day, it depend on the hour. And the area she was working in, it was like a market area where businessmen come in and out with trucks and different things. So it was really some decent paper there. And it was the thing about me is that uh, I didn't like my girls dating blacks. Cause one thing about when they date blacks is always a problem. They want too much for their money. They take their money back. Too much pressure on the chick. And then I wanted to make sure it wasn't no sneak boyfriend. You mm -hmm. did? So okay, here's the guy pull up on the stroll. Daylight, 
and wanted to date the female. You know what I mean? He might have been circling her two or three times. Pull up on her, ask her to date, and she tell him, no, I, you know, I'm not dating. You know what I mean? Chick understand, and you know, they got that good instinct, and they know things too. You know what I mean? Because this had been a dedicated female that had once before got shot in the leg, came home, tied it up, changed wigs, and went back to work. So I know she had a real she, understanding. But she she got shot in the leg. Yeah. Strap put a strap on her. Came home. Came home. Strapped it up. Strapped put it up. Put on a different wig and went back to work. So I know this with a she, with a bullet in her. Bullet went straight through the thigh. But she never went to the hospital or anything. Never went to the hospital. So she's basically bleeding outside almost. No, stopped all stopped of that, the tied bleed. it up, and okay. came back to work, chained wigs. Change so I know she was a qualified chick. So, okay, now back to the story about the guy, one of the black guy pull up on the stroll, wants to date her. She rejects the date. He pulls out a gun, shoots the girl five times. Think maybe a couple times in the head, body, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, I don't know nothing about it. I'm off somewhere else trying to, you know what I mean, level up my game, catch another chick. Get word that she'd been shot from another one of the girls that she at the county hospital. I called my sister. Uh, my older sister, she usually be the one that would go down to the jail and burn them out for me and everything. Tell her, let's go to the hospital. You know, I heard that Michelle has got shot. So we go to the hospital. I walked into the hospital. Her mother already there, her people. And me and my sister walk in and I look at her tools everywhere. Look like, you know, it's over. I step up in there. For some reason, the chick get electrified. And she raised up and said, Daddy, I wish I can get up out this bed and go get you your money. Now the chick laying here, bullets in her head and in her body, and she said it to me as soon as I walk in. Her mama there, her sisters and everything, and uh, her mother looked at me and said, what have you done to my daughter? I said, ma'am, nothing. I said, that's just dedication, ma'am. That's all it is. Pure dedication. This lady laying and possibly couldn't make it, but her whole thought is to get out of this bed and get me my money. Did she make it? Yes, yeah, she made she it. She made it. But you know what the sad story about it is? You know, it was the time of this PCP drugs and different things, and we had a little bit of it in our uh, family and things around us and different things, and I, I didn't like the girls using it, but I would try to get it to them at a certain time when we partying and kicking around, but this chick got so affected by it that after we wasn't together, uh, she was going to her mama's house and some other prostitute she had had a problem with was waiting in the bushes and jumped out and shot her one mm. time and it killed her. I went to her funeral and I thought I could really speak as a Mac and I was speaking about how cool and talking and all of a sudden I just broke down and started crying, man. Yeah. It was, you know, the woman had gave me something like 10 years of her life, pure dedication, man. and. It was just an amazing journey, and I'm saying that's how the game is, man. And it's still pretty much alive, you know what I mean? But just like I said, you know, it's just not as effective, and guys don't really hold women to what they say, and women don't really hold guys to what they say. It's a fake situation. Well, you got shot yourself, uh, close range. I got shot close range with a 30-gauge shotgun. I still got buckshots in me. In my finger, you know, they just couldn't pull them out. It's been like surgery everywhere. I still got buckshot that I can feel, that I can personally show you. Okay, what was that situation about? Uh, nothing. Coming up in the community, I just left a female house on my way to go play basketball with the rest of my friends, just walking down the street. And some guys pull up in a car, stick the shotgun out and boom. And that I was wind that. up spending like four days in a hospital, police asking me, hey, you think the girl, boyfriend, this and that and all of that? It just the, the way the inner city was. Yeah. You stand up, standing out on corners, the guys riding around looking to do violence, you know what I mean? See, you sitting out, I was just walking. Boom, shot me. You know, when you said in the beginning, when you had a choice of what to do, 
you know, you could have been a drug dealer, you could have been a, a bank robber, you could have been a murderer, you chose to be a pimp because it wasn't as illegal as the as the other ones, but it's still illegal. Yeah, it's still illegal. Right. But it's the oldest profession that's been going on since the beginning of time. I, I, agree. I didn't start it. <laughs> right. Well, and, and, it, and it ain't up to me. And, you know, like I said, I'm a victim myself. Right. You know what I mean? But it was a way of, of uh, economy, ways of getting money, right. uh, 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 ways of trying to duck the police. You know what I mean? See, a thing that you really got to understand, the gang is supported by the same people that despise it. Mm. The lawyers, the doctors, the judges, the police, the politician. They the one that support the gang. Oh, you think a pimp trying to date with another prostitute getting him her money? No. <laughs> These are the people that support the gang. It couldn't be no pimping if it don't be them for tricks. Okay, well, I mean, the reason why I said it is because in the eyes of the law, what you're doing is still illegal. And you had brushes with the law and so forth. I had plenty of brushes with the law. I remember the time the law I had... Um, the first slash back going down Madison Street, uh, Sevilla, Cadillac. The police arrested me, locked me up, took my car, drove it down the stroll. The stroll is where the prostitutes work. Mm -hmm. Arrested my prostitutes in my car, <laughs> brought them back to the station, brought them to see me and said, look, your man in the cage like a monkey. Parked my car, put two picks in the door lock so when I bonded out, I couldn't get in my car. He had put two picks in the door lock. Things happen like that in the game. But do you know that same police were transferred? This was on the north side. He was transferred to the west side. We become good friends. When I got <laughs> arrested, do you know I did not even get a bond? He let me out the basement, told mm. my friend to come get me. Things like that. It's amazing. It's like uh, different police used to tell me, guys want to be like you, Don Juan, but they can't be like you. They ain't you. I used to take the sergeant cases of champagne to the police station and drop it off to him. I mean, I used to do things different. Me and my prostitutes used to go places that they didn't want other pimps and prostitutes. They said, we don't mind you coming down, why? But we don't know about all them other people because I had a certain respect, a certain character, a certain way I told my girls to care of themselves. I used to take my girls every six months to the medical center to get checkup for diseases and things like that. You know, uh, when I retired, AIDS didn't come out to 85 when they started talking about it. Mm -hmm. I was finishing the game, man. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that when it comes to, to the pimp and the hoe, it's not a standard job arrangement. It's actually a relationship. It's definitely a relationship. Yeah. I mean... It's husband and wife. And the bond is even stronger than that because you don't know many wives that will go out and work for their husband and let the husband stay at home and bring the cat. So the bond is so much stronger. It's so much realer. It's so much life into it because of the excitement. And I mean, when you got that platform and the prostitute can stand up next to a man and know her man is number one and she getting a cheer, she feel that. That's the drive that make her want to go out and get a man some money to continue to keep him number one. That's what the gang is about, man. Well, I mean, the girls are going out and having, having sex for money and bringing it back to you, but you're having sex with the girls as well. Well, it's like quality time. You know what I mean? It's like you deserve this now. I'm your prize now. You know, it, it, it's a treat to the girls when they have a relationship with their pimp. You know what I mean? And, 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 and it's definitely a true understanding because see, you got to understand, it's more than just a sex relationship because when you sending a girl out to have sex, she all kind of size beefs. You know what I mean? So you ain't trying to be the best nailer. You trying to be her best man. 
not the one can do it to the best. That ain't what really counts. Survivor. Somebody that can take her to the next level. She can get sex anyway. You didn't show her that. Mm -hmm. But it's about the elevation that she needs somebody to come into her life to do, to stop the loneliness, to stop the hate, to bring her to that place where she wanted to feel like to be a queen, to put her in that position where other people respect her that would have never respect her if it's not for you being in her life. Well, you actually have children with some of your some of your girls, right? Yeah. How many? Man, you know what I mean? I'm baseball field action. Right. You did? Well, I, I heard. I got, I got kids. A, a but couple, you know, you got to understand. A couple dozen kids? Huh? A, I've, I've heard a couple dozen. Yeah. 20-something 20, 20 kids. You heard right. You have 20-something kids. You heard kids, right. And these were all with your, the girls that worked, worked no, for you? No, no, no. You got to understand. As a man, I'm a rolling stone. I had the will to do as I choose. I even had females to bring me females. So it wasn't all prostitutes. And then when it was prostitutes, they really wanted the baby by you. So you got to restrict them from nailing and definitely using a condom so that you know it's your baby. I even had a chick that had a baby, but it was a trick baby. But as a man, you had to claim it because she is your woman. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know what I mean? I was a married man. I didn't have a baby by my wife, by a different chick that was close to me. So it ain't just all about the prostitute. To have a baby by the prostitute with such, such respect and glory that you would give her that honor to have your seed. So how many children? It, it, it just don't really happen all the okay. time. Well, how many children do you have? You just said a couple of dozen. So man. twenty something children. Yeah. Do you? And I'm talking about, and, and you know, you got to believe as a man of my standard, it might be another ten that I don't even know about. Okay. That the female never even wanted to tell me about. I'm telling you. Okay. This no, happened in that kind of life, man. Okay. Do you because maintain you, a, a relationship with all your children? Oh yeah. Yeah. So they all talk Every to Every kid of mine have been associated with me that I know. Okay. Like I said, it's female that might don't even want to tell you about it till later. You know what I mean? You might hear about it on my birth certificate, uh, not my birth certificate, death certificate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. So, you know what I mean? But it's that way, you know? You've always been a weed smoker. You and I have smoked weed, I mean, just before this interview, <laughs> amongst many times. There you go, your own strain. Church cannabis. Church now cannabis. Now look, um, this is my brand. Um, I'm the spokesman for it. I picked this. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a connoisseur. I know the Snoop, Method Man, Red Man, and be real, y'all think top smoker, I top them. This is the number one strain in the game. This is church cannabis. And I'm talking about, man, for real. You just said yourself you smoked some. It's good. Oh, yeah. I'm, and I'm it's high right now. And it's <laughs> by the state of California. Mm -hmm. We got the best packaging anywhere. And, it, and it's legit. It's in dispensaries in Long Beach and Los Angeles, you know, and Topanga. I mean, it's around. It's the best strain you can be so don't fool yourself and let nobody fool you <laughs> church cannabis www.church.com and also put it in a spillerilla <laughs> extendo get the best smoke of your life jack that's what it is I, and i'm serious you know and it's a beautiful thing you know what i mean that i can be involved with it and that people take my word and i'm not just saying it because i believe in it i mean it's been endorsed by snoop dogg it's been endorsed about different real serious smokers. We, you know, and not only do it come pre-roll, they got the vape pipes, they got, you know what I mean? They got uh, the pre-rolled uh, blunt. So, you know, this is a product to deal with and every dispensary need to have it in their store. Now you've always been a weed smoker, but at one point you got on PCP. Well, this PCP was an early thing, like I said, early in the game. And I mean, they had it out here in California. I had to come all the way out here, get a friend, take me in some Compton project to get a little bottle of water. 
That's how much I wanted that PCP. That PCP is really an amazing thing. And what I'm saying is, is detrimental because it's a tranquilizer that they use for elephants to do breeding and different things like that. And here we was putting it in our brain. And to show you how dangerous it is, I got a friend that we have been friends for something like 15 years. And this guy was on PCP. He shot his baby mama. He shot his three-year-old baby, blowed the baby head off with a 357 Magnum. But before he did that, he fed the baby some Fruit Loops and he shot himself in the head. But he was under the influence that this really wasn't happening, that he thought that he would come back. Oh yeah. You know, this is how PCP give you that understanding. Yeah. I had some girls on it. Guys used to tell me, man, I can't take your girls to work no more. They jump out of my cab and run in and all of that kind of stuff. One of my girls, we went in a liquor store. She went inside the freezer. I couldn't get out. She wouldn't let nobody take her out the freezer. I mean, it had some really terrible effects on you, man. Oh, yeah. No, I interviewed a guy named Christ Bearer who got high off PCP and cut his own penis off. I was high as a motherfucking man with no sleep and shit and just frustrated because you know, I couldn't talk to my, my, my babies and shit like that. And I had like, I'm paying like three child support payments when I'm not seeing none of my kids and shit. Right. And then I really thought for that moment in time that I'm really hurting myself, just, you know, not having a vasectomy or whatnot, uh, you know, of that. And, okay. And it was just like, I was going to give myself one to tell you the truth, you know what I mean? That's the and, reason. You know, and I, I blasted off. Hi. So you know what I'm I was grab... watching Family Guy. Okay. I was watching Family Guy. And um, what's that other shit? Family Guy, American Dad. Okay. So I was like in the cartoon world. So when you smoke that 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 wet PCP, you be like, you know, it shit is like you just you're you, in you, the cartoon. You're in the electronic world, you're in the electron neutron world. The okay. shit is just not, you know, what happens in the subatomic world is different. What happens in the real in, in this okay. reality? So, so you were you in the fantasy saying? world. Not necessarily fantasy world. I wouldn't even say. Well, you were I was just in a world. In a different world. I was in a subatomic world. Let's you're say in that. a subatomic world, and you grabbed a knife. I don't know what I grabbed. Whatever nigga told you what I grabbed might be queer because I didn't. I don't know what I grabbed. It's like I would have turned my head at that point. You know what I'm saying? But shout out to my niggas. I ain't say nobody's queer because I don't know. I don't know what they said, but somebody said I just grabbed a knife. I cut my shit. Then right. I went back Steak and knife. I slife and I did some did some you know some Ginzu shit. It's like nah. I don't. I don't know. No. You don't no. remember it, but. I remember, I remember I made a flooper. I made I made I made I made a slice that was too puts away the knife or what I got, but that was too sharp. It was too sharp. Cause what I did, my shit was like she was like that shit was too sharp. It was I don't wanna say it was too sharp. I was too fucked up. To be honest, I grabbed yeah. some type of knife. I actually I must have grabbed some type of knife, a steak knife, and you know what I'm saying? And, and, and niggas who actually who see me grab a steak knife, they 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 justify it. Cause I would have I would looked at my ass too if I didn't want to grab the knife size I was, to tell you the truth. Make sure my life was not in jeopardy. Uh, so I, I recant that statement, but I did grab the knife and it was like out of frustration knife. due to the fact I couldn't see my kids and vasectomy and monk type of shit was on my mind. You know what I mean? It gives you that hallucination. I didn't have yeah. girls that jumped out the window. I didn't have girls jumped out of cars doing 50 miles an hour. Things like that, it give you a certain illusion where it frightened you and scared you. And it have you doing things that you think you're not doing that you're doing. That's the kind of effect. And I was so glad that God took that desire away from me. And you know, a lot of guys used to smoke it what they call smoke it wet. I didn't do it like that. I would mix it with some other weed. You know, but when they used to smoke it, like they say, off them Sherman sticks, it was a detrimental journey. Trust me. So you were taking PCP, and was it on a PCP high that you decided to quit pimping? No. It was the experience at one time I was smoking PCP that I was in the apartment, and... Um, I had jumped on the chick and the chick jumped off the balcony and ran to some neighbor's apartment. And um, I jumped over the balcony after naked, running down the street, and then one of the other parts who brought me my clothes. And then the police came that night knocking on the door looking for Don Juan. 
And I looked out, I didn't know what the police, did. I looked out on the back and, and I seen the police by the wall with his gun like that. And I slid back in the side door and I said, ain't no Don Juan here. I guess they didn't have no search warrant or anything. So they didn't kick the door in or anything like that. But I throwed all my drugs away and the flushed it down the commode and everything. And then I was looking at a program, a religious program. I wasn't trying to because I was turning every channel and every channel seemed like it was a religious station. And then the preacher said on one of the channels, I'd see somebody who had just been saved. I knew nothing about being saved, but I felt something was happening to me. Called my mother and told my mother. She said, call a preacher. She gave me a number because I said, I don't know no preacher number. And I called this preacher and he said, yeah, you have been saved like he was giving me confirmation. It, it, it was an amazing journey. I, I, I didn't realize it. Um, I, and this happened in California. And um, I left California, went back to Chicago. I joined this Bible school called Moody Bible Institute. It's the number two Bible institution in the country. Um, I started learning the Word of God. God told me after three years He was going to give me a church. I started pastoring. I founded and pastored my church. The first Sunday I was going to open up, the church caught on fire. Okay. Everybody was saying, oh man, you the <laughs> devil. They don't want to, you know. I mean, it was this kind of criticism. Yeah. But it was, A, but it was the best thing could have happened. Because when I was doing the church, I couldn't fix it like I want to because out the pimping, I didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. So when the church burned up, the owner said, don't worry about it. I got insurance. Beautiful. Put mirrors on the wall, in the ceiling, copied everywhere. My attorney friend paid for green and gold uh, pews, attorney yarn over. Man, it become the most beautiful church. Had something like 250 members. And then it was like all kind of churches would come each year to fellowship with a black, white, uh, all kind of, you know what I mean, uh, races. It was, a, they wanted to see the pimp that had got the church and the testimony that I gave them and everything. It was such a journey, man. And I used to go out and I used to evangelize at all kind of churches. They take me and I spend weeks uh, in Washington and Wisconsin and different places that, you know, evangelized, and it, it was amazing, man. Well, at the time that you stopped pimping, how much were you making per day? Like, what was the most you were pulling in on well, a day? Well, one thing about it is, I must say, you don't discuss money because, you know, the tax case and okay. everything. But wait, I'm going to explain all that to you. Mm -hmm. I had a tax case with the IRS. Um, they charged me for, I think, 74 and 75, and they gave told me I had to pay something like $125 a, a month for for seven years or something to try to pay the money back and everything, which I did that, you know what I mean? But I, I must confess that I was top of the line. I was driving Rolls Royces, <laughs> Cadillacs, had houses, the best of jewelry that anybody could have. So, you know, you, you you know what I mean? I was top of the line. I mean, I was like what they call a big hat, having money. They I had money where they was thinking like, man, you must be selling dope. Because, you know, dope dealers had plenty of money and things back in the 70s and 80s. You know what I mean? And I was riding that kind of tide, man. I had the best chicks, thieves, where I was getting diamonds, I was getting... Uh, Money, I was getting all kind of stuff they would bring home. So I was at the top of my game, man. And what year did you leave the game? 85 when God came into my life. So since From 1985, 72. so we're talking about over 30 years ago, almost 35 years now, you have not pimped at all. You have not taken I, money from a prostitute. I, uh, wait, hold it now. <laughs> Let me say it now. I don't do no pimping, but I still ask for money. Okay. I'm not afraid to ask women for money. Okay. You know what I mean? But what I'm saying, I haven't had a girl on the street. I didn't even have women come to me and offer to go on the street, and I rejected it. Mm -hmm. I didn't never thought I'd have done that in my days, because like I said, I used to say pimp or die, but I have rejected it. But I'm not going to reject money that a woman hand to me. 
I think it's part of the royalties of the gang. I deserve that. But when I interviewed Sugar Free, he told me that when they started calling it human trafficking, what changed overall? I mean, the name is scary. It is. <laughs> right. It's fucking scary. <laughs> it's fucking scary from pimping and pandering. I mean, to I human mean, a bitch, trafficking. A bitch get a loitering ticket and, you know, go, go about her way. But, you know, the game got so disrespectful, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, we wasn't brought up to pimp on no minors. You know what I'm saying? We wasn't brought up to, uh, you know, do certain things that, that, uh, that has evolved uh, in the generations. Uh, we wasn't taught those things, you know. You know, a lot of it's disrespectful. And, uh, but yeah, I, I seen it taking a turn and, and sure enough, man, yeah, here they come. And luckily yeah, you got trafficking. out. Human trafficking. And you got out the way. The word human. Wow, you know, human. Yeah. Human trafficking. Well, the thing about the gang is today that the gang is being misconstrued and disrespected. You know what I mean? I mean, they're not playing by the rules. Anything goes, mean anybody gonna go. So what I'm saying is you got guys now, in order to impress, they taking kids. Like over in Atlanta, the guys was busted for pimping girls as young as 10 years old. Hmm. In Chicago, guy just got, they got about 35 years in Atlanta. Chicago guy got 50 years, peach eye, for pimping girls that were 13 and 14 years old, had tattoos and all. That's disrespectful to the gang. I mean, really in the gang, you got to have females of age. And especially if you're a high profile pimp, you cannot run around with minors in your gang. You know, we had women that was raising kids. So we wasn't trying to pimp on kids. I just think that these players today don't have enough game to tell to their door, so they trying to tell it to a child. And you know, a child don't understand. All you got to do is show a child a few dollars a live flag, and they stuck. Yeah, man, but pedophilia uh, on any level is, is despicable. You know? Well, you know what I mean? I, you can call it pedophile, but I mean, we don't call it that on this label. We call it a misunderstanding, a guy that don't know what to do, you know what I mean, that he can't tell it to a, a adult, you know what I mean? And, you know, like I said, molesting a child is really out of, you know, out of order. You got to think. And, you know, like they said, pimps don't have heart, but I, I hey, I, hmm, pimps do have heart because they got kids. You wouldn't want your child to be pimped on at 10, at any age. But if it had to happen, you would prefer to be the grown-up. Well, you have daughters as well, I Yes, assume. I do. Did any of your daughters turn into prostitutes? Yes. They did? Yeah, I've had daughters that have been involved in prostitution. Okay. Yeah. I assume and being I didn't pimped had, by, I didn't by other men. I had a son that was involved in pimping. Okay. You know what I mean? So but, on both sides, but, okay. But, but, but my thing is, if it's something that you must do, even if they ask me today, you got to learn to do it right. You know, like I said, a lot of people have watched these Hollywood movies where they totally disrespect the female and totally disregard her family or anything. I used to take the mother's like holiday, Thanksgiving, turkey. Christmas, we make sure the mama is satisfied, have stuff for the kids and for herself. Back to school clothes for the kids. You know, it have to be a certain level of respect in order to make your gang survive. Okay, so you didn't feel any type of way over your own daughter prostituting? Well, with did you ever meet the pimp that was that was yeah, pimping? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I have a daughter now that works in a strip club. That just had a baby. That's got some guy. I just try to give him the proper direction, the proper understanding. If you choose to do this, know how to do this. I even have a daughter that is a lesbian. I don't condone that. But that's her decision. But I still love her. But I don't condone that. Hmm. 
I didn't even have a son that didn't done some pimping. That's they desire to do that. I don't encourage it. I don't say go to do this. My encouragement is stay in school, get your education, get you a nice job. What I was told, I even said myself, if my father had lived, I'd have been your lawyer, your doctor. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been your pimp. Well, you were friends with uh, Dennis Hoff, yeah. who owned uh, the Bunny Ranch. Rest in peace, Rest Dennis. in peace. Why didn't you ever go in the legal route in terms of, you know, the legal brothels or something like that? Well, the thing about it is I thought about that, but as a pimp, you don't want to split with nobody. Hmm. Even working folks don't like getting the government 50%. <laughs> so why would a pimp that's, you know, freelance and want to split his money? Oh, because you got to pay taxes. Right. Right. You don't pay taxes <laughs> as a pimp. Okay. You know what I mean? A lot of times I wanted to retire from the pimp gang. I thought about putting my girls in the massage parlor. But mm -hmm. it's always the thought of splitting your money with somebody else. And then you never know what the girl bringing you, you know what I mean? You take her word for it, or you got enough determination to believe that she would put everything on the table anyway. You know what I mean? So it, 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 it just that understanding, man. And being in the pimp game, you came in contact with a lot of interesting people. You and Mr. T have always been close friends. Well, Mr. T, uh, well, I, I was just telling uh, somebody the other day, uh, a friend of mine, uh, LaDonna Tiller, was a radio personality in Chicago. Uh, she appeared on the TV show Shy Now, mm -hmm. and I was telling somebody me and her was, you know, really cool together. And she, as a radio person, I had tickets to a heavyweight fight that took place in Chicago, 1980. Run into Mr. T, we become friends then. Most of the jewelry that Mr. T has come from me. Right. Yeah. So he kind of fashioned himself after you to a certain regard in terms of the jewelry and everything. Well, he always admired my style. You know, you come from Chicago, you know what I mean? I was yeah. the number one pimp in the country. I was getting action from all sides of the town because of my style, my flat, my jewelry, you know, my character, the whole thing. So after we met, we become friends. I used to pick him up at the airport. Even when he moved out here, I used to visit him. And uh, But then I had, you know, a lot of gold. Most of the gold he got, I sold it to him, mm. uh, you know, and the and the different things he made, like the spoon, the fall. My jeweler, which is called Ron Jeweler, he made the jewelry for him. Ron has passed on, you know what I mean? And the ring Mr. T wear that said, Mr. T, I gave it to him as a gift. Mm. No charge, you know. And another one he wore, I sold it to him and things like that. Okay. But, you know, we used to go out to the club together. We used to fellowship together. Not only with Mr. T, but Leon Isaac Kennedy, you know, James Kennedy. Husband. We all mm -hmm. used to fellowship and hang out together. The dramatics in the earlier days. You know, I'm familiar with the Shy Lights and Tyrone Davis. You know, I come up in the air where entertainment was the thing. So, you know, I fellowship with Bear White and a lot of different people. I've been coming out here to Hollywood since 1974. I, used, I was at the Image Award when Michael Jackson won his first Image Award from the NAACP. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at things like that. So, you know, I've been around this town. I used to hang out at Carlos and Charlie's on Sunset. Carlos and Charlie was a big place for all big stars and things like that. We used to hang there. You know, once this air and people see that, that's gonna give them a flashback. Cause it was a big thing. All the movie stars used to be there. Right, you were one of the first guests on Oprah's show when she launched. Well, as a matter of fact, Oprah came from Baltimore. I even did that show, it was <laughs> called People Are Talking, and came over to Chicago. I was really her first really major guest. I mm. had just got saved. I was in the Sun Time newspaper. It was 1985. Oprah just come to Chicago, and she needed something to boost that show, and I was the guy. Did you come in contact with R. Kelly at all? Me and R. Kelly are personal friends. Okay. As a matter of fact, the first time R. Kelly was involved in his uh, situation, he mm -hmm. called on me. And I went and prayed with him, and we spoke and everything. And as you know, as history uh, say, uh, he beat that case. Yeah. 
you know, there was an eight-year case, and he beat that case. And, you know, also as a tribute, he put my name in his song and stepping in the name of love, you know, Don Juan in them as All a right. tribute for my, you know, praying with him and being his friend. And uh, most recently when I was in Chicago, I stopped by the studio and uh, we talked and uh, he had a new blues album. He was wanted me to listen to because he said he respected my opinion. And mm -hmm. I had people around him say, you know, R. Kelly really uh, respect you and appreciate you and different things. So, yeah. you know, we, we friends, you know, people do what they think. I don't condone what he do. Uh, if it's fear that he got a problem, then he need to get help. Yeah. Like we all know jail is not the place for help. Uh, just seek help. Well, and then you and Snoop Dogg had a long friendship. Well, me and Snoop Dogg, his spiritual advisor, uh, had stood by his side many years. Uh, not only spiritual advisor, been a friend and been like a father figure and, uh, you know, uh, gave him the knowledge that I have received over the years. And, uh, and I see, you know, over the time that it had been a blessing, Snoop had become seriously now a monument, an entrepreneur, big star, a Hollywood star on the side, and I just feel strongly and thank God that he made me a part of that. Me and Snoop have been something like uh, the better part of his career over like almost 20 years, a better friendship. Well, yeah, and you, you've appeared in movies with him. Yeah, you we know. did old school. We did yep. Starts and Hust together. Mm -hmm. First time I met Snoop, it was in 1994 in Atlanta at the Freak Nick. <laughs> and uh, I was at a show in Chicago, and he seen me in the audience and told him to bring me in the back. And from then on, we've been friends. And he told me if I ever come out to California, look him up and, you know, it, 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 it's been a journey, you know. I'm the one, you know, used to call Jamie Foxx for Snoop and different things like that, for Snoop even know him. Even we were at one of the awards, you know, I tapped Prince on the back, say, hey, Prince, Snoop want to say hello to you. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, counseling him, do different things he had went through, even during the Suge Knight era, I stood with him and, you know, gave him advice and, you know, he respected my advice and, you know, like I said, uh, I'm just glad to see his journey is so fulfilled, his family growing, and he, have, he sees some of his work by the compound, and it's just amazing. I'm just glad to be a part of that, and I feel that God puts me on these journeys, and uh, it's an amazing journey, man. You know, here we are, you're almost 30 years, or more than 30 years out of pimping. But like you said before, prostitution is the oldest profession. And it's going to continue to go on it's until somebody anywhere. cut the lights on this small planet. You did? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the way it is. I mean, and, and I, don't, I don't knock it. And the reason I say that is because it has been effective in some men's lives. I mean, married men. A lot of married men can't get what they want at home. And it ain't always sex. Sometimes they buy conversation. They buy company. You know what I mean? And it's things that wives won't do at home. You know, once you be with your, your wife, before y'all married, y'all doing everything. <laughs> but once you get married, now she don't want to give you no head. Now she don't want you to get no jacket. Uh, you know what I mean? Things like that. She don't want to play with it no more. I mean, a lot of things interest be low, which you can get from a prostitute. Spend your money, going back home. Nothing ain't happened. Well, do you think that, you know, prostitution has always been around, but do you think in 2019 the pimp is still necessary when you have the internet and, well, I mean, you had Backpage, it got shut down, but, you know, that was a big a big hub for prostitution. Well, and so that's forth. a good reason to let you know that you need a pimp by your side just by the Backpage, just by that guy <laughs> killing the prostitute, different things like that. See, a prostitute needs a pimp. She needs that guiding. She needs that somebody to show that love. And, and, and she needs that understanding. And the only one can really understand that is a pimp. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because he gonna give us some instruction before she fall into destruction. You know what I mean? Because she needs to know. And like I said, 
The instruction ain't just for a prostitute, it's for a human being, period, to survive and move in life. It just happened to be a pimp giving it to a prostitute. Mm. Well, Don Magic Juan, it was a hell of a story. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever done it like you before. Hey, I'm the best that ever done it, and they say got away with it. From Pimp Stick to Pulpit. I actually read that book before you and I met. Yeah, but it's a mole here. This is the second edition. Right. As you can my, see my, my on version looks different. This is the last man standing. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? I didn't stood the test of time. This internet, you know, this pimping, you know what I mean? I mean so much to where not only my life story, but I have a 33 daily spiritual guide. I mean, you know what I mean? I understand even through life, no matter what you do, you still need guidance and understanding and instruction. I have a major internet social media going where people tell me daily, thank you for the instruction. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you for giving me a word. That's what I do on my social media. It have nothing to do with likes, uh, people, uh, joining the site. I'm just giving instruction. I might be the only one on social media that don't follow over two people that got almost 2,000 uh, guests. Yeah. You can check, you can search the whole social media. I'm willing to bet everybody follow more than two people. Or they ain't gonna get no hit. I'm not interested. I'm getting <laughs> you gang, free gang knowledge for the, you know, for living. Yeah. A way of life. You just happen to be getting it from Don Magic Wand. But it's gang you can live by. I didn't have people call me preachers, doctors, lawyers, politicians, said I read your book. I'm not no pimp. But it helped my life. Yeah. Well, I read your book. It uh, makes a difference. It was, it was definitely a great read. Uh, and like I said, man, you're looking great. You're looking healthy. Um, you know, I wouldn't have guessed your age if you were to ask me. You know, if we didn't already know each other, I would have guessed, I would have guessed maybe 50. You know? Yeah, but and, then, you know, like I said earlier in the show, it's all about you taking care of yourself. You yes. know, I smoked a lot of weed, but you never heard me say I do cocaine. Right. You never heard me say I do uh, acid, yeah. uh, any of them drink syrup or any of them Ecstasy, things. Ecstasy, nothing. I've been a weed man all my there life. There you go. Since about 12 years old, some player threw me in the back of the car, took me around the block, lit up a joint. I've been stuck ever since. Well, I, there you go. And at 67 years old, man, if you want to look like this at this age, do they see yeah. my name on my shoes? Oh, can, hey, you man, I'm telling you, play a lie around here, Jack. I'm talking about for real. Pimp shoes. I'm in it to win it, and <laughs> I can't quit. And it ain't no cast that drop, so I'm still in the running. That's what it is. Don Magiquan, always a pleasure when we meet up. Church, preach, tabernacle, and that's the only way we're going to get any action. That's how we do it. Peace. <laughs>